Our engine rebuild has come pretty far, but something we haven't addressed since we removed it is the flex plate. Despite its somewhat rough appearance, we will be reusing the old 14-inch 168-tooth plate that came on the engine. But we won't be using it as is, we'll clean that up quite a bit by taking it to the blasting cabinet, and once we've worked our way all the way around, it is down to a bare metal surface. Even though it's not a part you'll see once the engine is installed, it's still nice to know that all of that rust is off of it. We'll give the flux plate a quick and dirty paint job that admittedly came out pretty terrible, but again, it's okay because it won't really be visible. Stop looking at it. But we won't be leaving it at that because, well, like everything else on this build, we've got some modification to do. GM used a 10 and 3 quarter inch bolt pattern for the smaller torque converters and an 11 and half inch for the larger ones. Since this engine was probably mated to a 4L80E, it has the 11 and half inch pattern. Which is going to be a problem, because at least for now, we're going to be keeping the Turbo 350 that's already in the car and has a 10 and 3 quarter inch pattern converter. To help illustrate this problem, here's an old 700R4 converter that uses that same small pattern. A trio of M10 by 1.5 bolts holds the flex plate to the converter. Or rather they would if any of the holes lined up. I've heard from some people that slotting the bolt holes is a very bad idea and will definitely lead to failure, but for them I just want to point out this. That's the factory bolt fitment. Clearly, GM doesn't think that the bolt needs to be super snug in the flex plate. The centering and positioning is all done by the pilot on the torque converter and not these bolt holes out on the edge. So as long as we don't do anything too ridiculous, I don't see this modification causing any problems. We'll start with an eighth of an inch bit and drill out the centers for the new bolt hole locations, following that with a quarter of an inch bit, and now we get to the tricky part where the two bolt holes are going to meet up, which means drilling them is going to be a bit of a pain. This step drill bit was kind of working, but I decided to go back to a standard 3 of an inch bit and carefully, slowly, nibble away at each of the new bolt locations. That gave us a good starting point, and we'll finish everything off with a hand file. Due to the nature of their operation, I was kind of expecting the steel these flex plates are made out of to be a bit springier and harder, but it actually drilled and filed just fine. And pretty soon we can loosely install those torque converter bolts and confirm that the fit is going to work. Just like before, we've got a bit of play, and by running a drill bit around the pilot of the torque converter, we can ensure that there is enough wiggle room for everything to fit together naturally. It seems to be suited to the 10 and 3 quarter inch bolt pattern just fine, so it's time to reinstall it on the engine. It was pretty difficult to get off of there, and I've added a layer of paint to the center register, so we'll have some sandpaper at the ready and sand just as much as we have to to get it to fit onto the back of the crankshaft without a fight. And of course, we'll also be adding a healthy dose of anti-seize between the two parts. Now that it's in place, we can go dig out the bolts and the high strength red thread locker. We'll get each of the six bolts in place before snugging them down and using a flex plate holding tool to help us torque them to 30 and then 60 foot pounds. And now that we have the flex plate back on the engine and ready to go, we can get to work on the starter. We certainly could have reused the one that's already on the car, but I decided to go with an aftermarket style that is clockable. With the factory solenoid location being fairly close to the header, I had quite a few hot start problems with the car, which were mostly solved by heat shielding, but especially after adding the supercharger, every once in a while it would have some trouble starting the engine immediately after being shut off. My hope for this one is that we can simply rotate it to get the solenoid away from the headers and not have that problem at all. I will say I've never used this style of starter before, or one from this brand at all, so fingers crossed that it all goes as planned. To go along with it, I got this set of shims and studs, mainly for those knurled mounting studs. To make sure we have a nice flat surface and a good electrical connection to the block, we'll take sandpaper to the surface of the mounting pad, 
And once most of the paint is out of the way, we'll apply some anti-seize to the studs and thread them in. The knurling on starter bolts and studs goes up into the block just a bit and helps to keep everything aligned. These are the bolts that came with the starter, and they're just standard cap screws, which is why I didn't really want to use them. Realistically, it would probably be okay, but I'd rather that starter be held really tightly in place. This is a dual pattern mount that supports both 153 and 168 tooth flex plates. And once we have it lined up correctly, we will snug and then torque the mounting nuts down to 32 foot-pounds. That's the number printed in the manual for the starter. And now that it's solidly in place, we need to take a look at how the pinion engages with the ring gear. On the old GM style starters, you can pry the pinion out with a screwdriver, but in this case it's pretty sunk into that mounting block, so we're going to have to bring over a battery. With the body of the starter grounded to the negative post, we can connect the positive wire to the terminal on the back of the solenoid. That'll cause it to throw out the gear, but not energize the motor. In this case, it's pretty obvious that we're going to need some shimming because there is no space at all between the teeth of the ring gear and the valleys of the pinion. To create some distance between the two, we will remove the starter and add a thin shim between it and the engine block. Once it's been torqued back down, we will once again energize the starter solenoid, and this time we do have a gap to measure. Our high-end calibrated tool is this paper clip, which does not fit between the gear teeth and tells us that we're going to need more space. The single shim that came in the kit just wasn't enough, so I had to find some others I had sitting around. We'll stack two shims together to make a thicker spacer, but the pinion still needs a bit more room. So we'll try a stack of three shims with a sixteenth of an inch overall thickness, get the starter torqued down, and the pinion extended. Finally, we have the fit we were looking for. It's snug, but the paperclip does slide in between the teeth of the ring gear and the valleys of the pinion. That should give us the ideal engagement depth, which leaves a bit of room for expansion and movement of parts. What I don't love is the width of engagement between the pinion and ring gear. You typically want between a quarter inch and three eighths of an inch, and in this case we're only seeing about 0.27 inches, which is technically okay, but all the way down at the low end. We'll see if we can improve that in just a minute, but right now I really want to see if we can get the starter to turn the engine over. This time, we're connecting both the solenoid and motor feed terminals. This mini starter uses 6 to 1 gear reduction, which is probably most of the wine and not the pinion to ring gear contact. At least with no spark plugs in the engine, that motor is perfectly willing to turn it over, but what about the exhaust clearance? We'll go ahead and install the passenger side header to take a look. I've certainly seen worse, the solenoid isn't directly up against the tubes, but it's not exactly far away from them either. Going with a starter that'll let us move the solenoid away from all that heat was probably a good choice. To get that adjusted, we'll remove the header and the starter from the engine. Over on the bench, we can loosen the three cap screws holding the motor to the mounting block. That was really loose. That was pretty loose too. I mean, one of those was like significantly tight. And once they've been fully loosened, the motor and solenoid assembly can be separated. This shim was on there from the factory, and by removing it, we should be able to improve our tooth engagement depth. Which is a nice bonus, but the main reason we're here is to spin this thing around. Over at the engine, we'll figure out exactly where we want that solenoid to sit, which in this case is kind of up against the oil pan. With that figured out, we'll reinstall the three cap screws with some medium strength thread locker and get them much tighter than the factory bothered to. Then we can once again reinstall the starter and torque it down one last time. This position places the solenoid much farther from the heat of the exhaust, and hopefully still has it far enough out of the way that it won't get hit by rocks going down the road. 
we'll energize the solenoid, and what do you know, we've got 0.30 inches instead of 0.27. Sounds like a small difference, but I'll take everything we can get here. And of course we'll double check our pinion to ring gear clearance, which is still looking fine, and there's about an eighth of an inch between the two with the pinion retracted, which is exactly what we're looking for. So, now that all that's taken care of, there's really just one last thing to tinker with before the engine is ready to go in the car. We'll be running these Excel spark plugs, mostly because I got a lot of them on clearance. They're a bit shorter than standard, which should help with plug boot clearance, but otherwise they're pretty typical. These came out of the box with a 30 thou gap. We're just going to bring that up to 035, which is the factory spec for this engine, and I'm sure is good enough for what we're doing here. We'll dab some anti-seize on the threads and get all of those in place before torquing them to 15 foot-pounds. Realistically, it would be better to install these after the engine is in the car because we are risking breaking one in the process of dropping it in, but we'll be installing it with the headers in place so they'll be fairly protected. Mostly just for fun, we'll install the belts on the front of the engine one last time so that we can see everything together. We'll also pop those protective caps off of the carburetors in order to install these base plates, air cleaners, and this scoop. You didn't think we'd just leave those bare forever, did you? I chose this aluminum scoop because I liked the look, and it was really cheap. It had been 11 months since purchasing the engine and supercharger, and it was certainly a learning experience trying to find all the parts, fit them together, and make them work as one. Just about every piece of this thing was made or modified, and the fact that it's finally all together is really motivating. Which is good, since we're still pretty far from being done, and there will certainly be changes and additions in the future. But, along the way, sometimes it's worth it to stop and admire what you have. We haven't heard the last of our problems, but at least we're kind of on a new set of them. The engine is just about ready to go in the car. To give us a bit more space, we'll be taking off some of the accessories, like the alternator, power steering pump, and the carbs and supercharger up top. We'll also take this opportunity to find out something I've been curious about this entire time, the weight of the engine. Using this hanging scale, we'll be picking up the engine with a load leveler and the cradle installed, which means we'll have to subtract their weight from the total. With the whole thing off the ground, we'll let the scale settle, and eventually it lands on 631.8 pounds. Weighing them separately, the engine cradle came in at 18 pounds and the load leveler at 12, which means the engine as seen here weighs in at 601.8 pounds. But we're still missing a few heavy parts, like the 250 supercharger, which comes in at 47.6 pounds, the carburetors at 12.5 each, the hood scoop at 8.3, and that massive blower idler pulley at 5, plus the power steering pump and alternator at about 20 combined. Add all that together and we have a grand total of 707.7. .7. It's not exactly a lightweight setup, but how does it compare to the small block that's currently in the car? That we'll have to answer in the next episode when we remove it. Hello, friend.